welcome to the Longevity Forum podcast, a series on achieving longer, healthier, and more fulfilled lives for as many as possible. In this episode, we are pleased to have Andrew J. Scott, co-founder of the Longevity Forum, who will be discussing the biology of aging with Tom Kirkwood, a biologist and the Associate Dean of Aging for Newcastle University. Now to you, Andrew. Uh, thank you very much, Laura and Tom. Thank you so much for sparing your time today. It's a great pleasure, Andrew. Very nice to talk. And I'm really looking forward to uh, uh, talking to you. And you know, as Laura says, you've uh, been in Newcastle for a long time, and you're uh, emeritus, uh, and you're a mathematical biologist. And you know, your research in the 70s, developing disposable thoma theory, has of course been incredibly influential. So perhaps you can just tell us a bit about that 1977 Nature paper and the theory and its implications. The disposable soma comes from uh, asking how much an organism should invest in bodily maintenance and repair. The reality is that, you know, within our bodies, every minute, every second of our lives, all kinds of things are going wrong. And we have amazing maintenance systems uh, to put the vast majority of these things right. But these systems we now know are quite expensive in terms of the energy costs they take to run. And, you know, we need to ask what is worthwhile investing in maintenance? So from a biological point of view, if we think of this as a question in evolutionary biology, the way we address the kind of big why questions in science, the answer is uh, that what we need is a body that keeps itself in good repair for as long as it has a reasonable chance still to be alive, but that more than this is a waste. And now we have to think about organisms as they exist, you know, sort of in the natural wild environment within which evolution occurs. So perhaps it's easiest to think of this in terms of, for example, a mouse. Uh, we have quite good data from field studies in biology looking at the mortality rates of mice in the wild. And we know that in the wild, it's quite unusual for a mouse to live longer, much longer than about a year, a year and a half tops. So what does a mouse need in terms of the maintenance and repair of its body? It needs a body that will not begin to show signs of major deterioration till it's perhaps a year, a year and a half old. And that basically is what we have for mice. They will live if we keep them in a laboratory or if we keep them as a pet. They will live uh, as long as three years. As we, as we see from the field data, life expectancy in the world is a good deal shorter than that. Now, uh, we can then extend this to thinking about the longevity of a species like our own, human. Uh, and uh, obviously, we are larger, we have evolved greater brain size than the mouse. We know how to do things that allow us to have a greater expectation of life in the world. So how long do we need the human body to last for? Well, if we go back into distant sort of records, we can see that you know, people certainly lived uh, 30, 40, 50 years, sometimes even longer than that in the past. But basically, what we need from our body is that it lasts well enough to keep us in good shape through perhaps 40, 50, 60 years. And that is that is what we have. So uh, the the implications of this are quite important, because what they tell us is that because in the wild, deaths mostly occur from accidental causes, things like infection, starvation, cold, uh, being predated. The body is programmed for survival, not for death. Uh, so the idea that somehow the aging process is a programmed mechanism, you know, to get rid of us when we're time expired, uh, doesn't really make sense. But the disposable soma theory of aging tells us that we age because there was never a sufficient evolutionary priority to invest enough in maintenance to keep the body going indefinitely. And it's a, you know, obviously a fascinating theory. And of course, it builds on a notion that in some sense in nature, aging is unnatural because not many animals live to that uh, right, to older ages, which of course is the starting point then of this, this concept of, of trade-off and just focusing much more energy around maintenance and reproduction. The notion of programming, though, perhaps... Uh, you know, it's programmed for survival, so therefore aging is a side error. And how would you describe the implications for aging? Well, aging 
is, uh, according to this idea, it's a natural process, but it's a process that is going to be relatively rarely seen uh, in the kind of natural environment. It is, uh, it, it is a side effect of the way evolution prioritizes how it builds and maintains and repairs the body. So, um, you know, age, aging is not there for a reason. It occurs because as we live our lives, uh, we have a gradual build-up of damage. Um, it starts off at a very low level. When a newborn baby is born, the age clock is effectively reset to zero. But from the very first stages of our life, we begin to accumulate little faults. Every time a cell divides, it's likely to add a few new mutations to the DNA uh, that provides the core genetic information in the cell. Other changes occur, and we now have a lot of information about the different kinds of damage that contribute overall to the aging process. Looking at aging from this point of view is, is important because it tells us that there's not likely to be a single mechanism uh, that is responsible for a aging and ultimately for death. Uh, we see within the field of research on aging, there have been a large number of theories that have been put forward over the years that aging is due to this particular cause. It might be the erosion of the protective tips at the ends of our chromosomes, things known as telomeres. It might be that aging is caused by the accumulation of mutations in our cells. It might be, you know, because we accumulate uh, bad, damaged forms of proteins. Uh, and I think uh, the a part of the problem and the thing that limited progress for a long time was that these were seen as rival competing mechanisms. Uh, what we now understand, and this really uh, is directly a prediction from the disposable soma theory, is that aging is caused by all of these things going on together. So it tells us uh, about the uh, complexity of aging. But also the fact that aging is not programmed uh, leads us to one of the most important insights that comes from the science, and that is that the aging process is much more malleable than we used to think. Uh, the rate at which damage builds up is going to be influenced by a mixture of intrinsic and extrinsic factors. So the intrinsic factors would be things like your genetics. We know that longevity does to some extent run in families. And that means that if you come from uh, long-lived parents and grandparents, you probably have a genetic endowment that gives you a greater capacity to maintain and repair the damage that causes the aging process. But the other really important aspect of this is that it's not all down to the genetics. We know that the genetics contributes only about a quarter or a third of what will influence the length of your life. A very important contribution comes from the way we live our lives, from things like lifestyle, uh, nutrition, housing, the sort of the, the things that can impact on the body uh, as we go through uh, the years. Absolutely, and we'll come on to that malleability later. But that understanding and exploiting that malleability of how we age is obviously key. Um, I mentioned this was 1977, the Nature paper. I think you were 26 when that paper was published. What, what was it that attracted you to this issue of aging then? Well, it, it was really curiosity. Um, I hadn't been thinking about aging particularly, uh, but it, as often happens, uh, you know, sort of in shaping how one's career uh, you know gets going um it was it was a bit of luck i i had an encounter with a very distinguished molecular geneticist who was working on a problem that had to do with aging cellular aging um uh, he he thought i had some expertise that could help uh, he he put the question to me we worked on that uh, and we started publishing some papers that had to do with the cellular mechanisms of aging so I was just really fascinated by this process that's universal in the sense that, you know, all of us are going to age and die sometime. Uh, that is certainly something seen across a great you know, swathe of the animal kingdom. Um, and I just thought well, this is really neat. And as far as I knew, there had been very little work done on this. So I was thinking about it as a challenge in biology. I wasn't at that stage thinking about it very much from the point of view of older people and how it impacts on our lives in today's society. Yeah, really interesting. And I think, you know, um, for me, I find the whole concept of longevity fascinating because it's such a broad intellectual topic. 
and of course one of those huge macro trends that's changing the world around us but it's also bizarrely i think one of those big macro trends something that just touches us as individuals in such intimate ways so speaking from a non-research perspective you know you were 26 you're not 26 now how has your insights or your views on this work changed over time how has your views on aging shifted and i note also that you ran the newcastle 85 project and i'd be interested to know what you learned from that as well if you can tell us a bit about that it's uh, absolutely true that you know getting older is a a lesson uh, in many many ways um so uh I, I, I think the important thing is that you know all of us, as we get older, discover that uh, it's a challenge and an opportunity to learn. Um, what I find is that after doing research on aging for so many years, you know it's both interesting and exasperating to experience it for real. Um, yeah. uh, I, I can kind of observe the process perhaps with a greater degree of insight because of what I know about the underlying biology. But that doesn't mean that it doesn't lessen some of the you know, some of the difficulties that come. There are some things, you know, that I find perhaps more annoying than others, and I suspect we all have a very personal and individual experience of the aging process. So one of the things that we know about aging is that it is individual. There's a great deal of diversity, um, and it was, you know, sort of something to do with this that led to starting up the Newcastle 85 plus study um, back in 2005, 2006. Uh, in, in 2001, I'd had the, you know, the great delight of being asked by the BBC to give the wreath lectures on the subject of aging. Um, and 2001 uh, was a census year because the, the censuses tended to happen tend to happen in the, the first year of each decade. Uh, and uh, quite a number of viewers uh, got in touch with me after I'd given the lectures to say, did I realize that in the 2001 census form, there was a question at the front that basically asked if you were ever, I think it was 75. Mm. Uh, and if the answer was yes, you were instructed to turn to the back page, sign your name and send the form in without filling in all the pages in between. Um, and, and they were quite rightly offended by this. It was as if, you know, it was almost a matter of policy not to, you know, not to ask people about, uh, you know, sort of the experience of aging. Perhaps the assumption, the default assumption was the ageist one that, you know, people at a great age would be in some way impaired in completing the form or, or just that it wasn't of particular interest. And yeah. I was struck by, you know, this sort of paradox that we knew then that the age group we're talking about, the 85 plus, uh, is the fastest growing demographically uh, in the country, but it's also an age group about which remarkably little was known. So uh, at that stage, I was director of the Institute for Aging and Health in Newcastle a fabulous institute with uh, you know, sort of a great spectrum of, of highly uh, qualified researchers covering aging from the biological point of view through the, the clinical, the medical point of view to the social point of view. Um, and we thought it would be important to uh, try to find out more about what being 85 and above was really all about. Uh, so uh, we got funding uh, to run the study the study had a very, um, you know, sort of, in a way, a very simple design. It was to approach everyone uh, who was registered with the NHS in Newcastle. Uh, this was beginning in 2006, who had been born in the year 1921. So this was the year in which they reached their 85th birthday. Then to gather as much information about them as we could from a whole variety of perspectives and to follow them uh, over a number of years. And the study has continued uh, you know, sort of pretty much to the present time. So it threw up some really remarkable information, um, things that surprised you know, sort of even the health professionals within the team who had been working with older people, the nursing teams uh, and the, the doctors. Uh, but they had had experience of older people who were coming to their attention because they had illnesses, health problems. And I think the, the extraordinary thing about this was to discover the, the high levels of quality of life, of vitality and capability that existed in the 1,000-plus uh, 
participants who agreed to take part in the study. And that's a great example. And in, you, know, you put it starkly about the census as well, because you know, your disposable soma theory says that evolution has never had a reason really to focus on uh, end of life and aging. But of course, the same is reflected in society and how we think about older people, given the relatively small number of reached old ages in the past compared to now. So that's a great example of society, I think, just mimicking those evolutionary tendencies, which means there's a whole lot more to discover, particularly, as you've stressed, if aging is malleable and we are living these long lives, then, you know, for me, one of the biggest health challenges is then how do we age well and how do we exploit that malleability? Um, and that diversity of age, I think, is really interesting. And of course, we are focused on chronological measures of age and the idea of a cutoff for when you're old. And you know that work just obviously starts to break down some of that um, simplicity of chronological age. Because, of course, I think there's two problems with chronological age. The first is it doesn't really capture the longer lifespans people have got because it's a backward-looking measure. It also doesn't focus on the malleability of age because every year you're just one year older. Uh, so uh, I think you know society has to adjust because obviously evolutions can take a long while to adjust to these longer years. But what the features I really like about your work, one of the many, is it's sort of double-edged edge nature because, you know, you're characterizing your work by a, a deep-seated long-run optimism. You know, you say that aging uh, isn't, we're not programmed to age. Uh, and, you know, you, in, in, you quote um, that uh, in, the, you know, in the long run, there's kind of no limit to what may be achieved. But you rely that with also a deeply cautious note about there being no quick fix i just wonder have you any reason over the the, the past years to shift either that long-term optimism or the short-term caution <laughs> um it's interesting to 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 look back and think how the optimism and the caution might have changed the optimism i think is completely unaltered um the, the the essence is, you know, that there is no overriding genetic program that makes us age that we have to somehow dismantle, take apart and set to one side. Uh, you know, sort of there is the, the malleability that we can exploit. Um, I think we need, though, to temper this with a recognition that that doesn't mean that it's just a piece of cake to be able to kind of make ourselves live mm. indefinitely, perhaps forever. Um, the fact that aging is not programmed does not mean that it is not highly sort of reproducible. We we age because in evolution, uh, limited priority was placed on the investment and repair the investments in maintenance and repair processes that keep us going. So you know what makes us age is the build up of damage. Um, we we believe that it is going to be possible to impact that. Um, I mean, there's evidence to some extent that this is, uh, you know, sort of a, a possibility, um, and that comes from things like the fact that how long you can expect to live is influenced very much by your socioeconomic status. So we know that if you can do the things that correspond to improving uh, your sort of circumstances of life, the chances are that you will enjoy more years of better quality. Uh, than, than if you're sort of stuck, uh, you know, with a very disadvantaged uh, set of circumstances. So the evidence of the malleability is there in front of us. That doesn't mean that uh, it's going to be easy to to make change. Um, and that's the reason for the caution. Um, I think uh, the, the optimism is also driven by excitement about what the science is revealing. We're learning a great deal more about the aging process all the time. Uh, we're beginning to get a clearer sight of the targets where we might want to attempt intervention if we wanted to improve our individual prospects of living longer and healthier lives. Uh, but, uh, you know, we, we have to be very, very careful uh, not to, you know, sort of try to run before we can walk. Um, and I think uh, getting uh, a lot more detailed information about, you know, so what is the aging process? What are the opportunities uh, to, to to try to improve things? Uh, in a sort of, we, we just need to be very, very careful not to over-promise. Yeah. We have a great phrase in your uh, Reef Lectures, The End of Age book, which is a wonderful book, by the way, and also wonderfully short. 
um, where you say that you know we're likely to understand the machinery of human agency and aging and how it works, but not how to drive it for a, a long while. And I thought that was a, a great quote. So I, I kind of want to build on that because my first half of my research career was as a macroeconomist and you know, working with ministers of finance and central banks about how to try and steer the economy. Uh, and in economics, there's a very simple uh, propositional law, Tim Bergen's law, which says if you've got N targets, then you need N instruments to control those N targets. Uh, you know, the Bank of England can't, with just one instrument, interest rates control both inflation and unemployment. And, you know, you stress that although uh, ageing, we're not programmed to age, there are multiple ways uh, or, or marks of ageing. So there's lots of different pathways. What's your view in terms of how big N is for ageing? Do we need to control all of those pathways, do you think? Um, it, it's a really interesting question. And I think the parallels between economics and, you know, sort of this kind of biology are fascinating in a way that disposable soma theory is, you know, sort of uh, equivalent to an argument that you could develop from an economic perspective. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I think one has to be a little bit careful about, you know, sort of trying to map things across from one discipline to another because there are, you know, perhaps, you know, different ways of working. In terms of the mechanisms of aging, yes, it's absolutely true that there are mul multiple mechanisms and there are multiple targets, um, uh, you know, that we might have in mind when we try to develop, uh, you know, sort of anti-aging remedies. Getting to grips with this complexity is going to be essential in making progress. So, um, I, I think it's too, uh, you know, sort of simple a way of thinking of the question to ask what N is in terms of the mechanisms of aging, particularly because you know, sort of these are interacting networked processes. So uh, there are multiple levels at which they operate, um, and it's interesting and important to understand this a bit more profoundly. Um, what I think we might hope for is that there are some more basic mechanisms than others. So uh, if we can get a better insight into the way that these networks are structured, we may be able to target a relatively smaller number of processes that are primary um, and, and, and give rise to secondary impacts that will be, will be changed in concert. Um, so, uh, you know, sort of, I, I basically, I'm, I'm, I'm ducking trying to answer the question with a definite estimate. <laughs> like a good economist, too. Um, I, I think it's, it's something where we need to know more about how they truly work. The yeah, other I, I that, agree. And, and actually, I think the analogy is still there with the economy, because, of course, there's huge numbers of, of channels and pathways that are interlinked. So the notion is, are there just a, a few key ones, say interest rates or taxes? Uh, and, and I agree. I, I would be very interested. I'm not sure economists approve there are just a couple of simple instruments, but it'd be interesting what the biologists do as well. Um, do you have any instinct about the most promising areas of current research in geroscience in terms of those different channels, or are you just waiting to see what develops? I think uh, you know the the field is in a very exciting state at the moment. Uh, it's been wonderful to see the expansion in interest in aging, uh, and this has attracted, you know, sort of large numbers of, you know, really able scientists to turn their attention to aging questions. So, you know, we, we're learning things all the time. I mean, there's a lot of interest currently in the possibility of some kind of reprogramming of the mechanisms that set the genome to be played out in a particular kind of way. So, um, you know, so called epigenetic mechanisms there's, there's a great deal of interest in what m might be possible there um, some some mechanisms are perhaps going to be easier to work with than others um, uh, it's uh, it's clear that uh, clearance turnover mechanisms are, are important in aging um, we know that as faults and damage accumulate within cells you get you know sort of a whole lot of molecular garbage effectively accumulating within the cells and there's evidence that if you can uh, work on the the mechanisms that remove that uh, that garbage uh, and recycle the uh, constituent parts um, you may be able to uh, generate some kind of significant improvement I think a theme of my own work over the last 20 years has been 
very much trying to understand the way that these networks operate uh, in a sort of in a coordinated way. Uh, and that's been quite fruitful because it's shown that there exist interactions that uh, you know sort of could potentially be exploited. We're learning a lot about the role of uh, a phenomenon called cell senescence. Uh, this is how cells change their state in response to stresses and damage um, and, and, and enter you know, sort of a condition that seems to be detrimental to the tissue in which the senescent cell sits. So there's a lot of excitement about the potential for what are called senolytics. Uh, these are agents that will remove senescent cells from tissues. Um, and uh, there's there's considerable focus on the, the the health benefits that might result from senolytic therapies. So I think all of these approaches show show great interest and great promise. I think um, the kind of the caution uh, that uh, I I believe to be very important comes into play here because we really need to understand what is going on before we try. Uh, too confidently to engineer change, you know, sort of to use a rather uh, common analogy of the aging process, which is the wear and tear of a motor car. You know, if if things start to go wrong in your car and you take it into the garage to have someone have a look at it, you really hope they have an understanding of how it's put together and how it should be working when it's working properly before they jump in there with their instruments and try to sort of to change things. So um, for me, the question of you know sort of understanding you know how the system is configured is one that gains a lot of uh, power from the insights of evolutionary biology and for example recently in the context of cell senescence uh, i and some colleagues have found it it illuminating to sort of ask why this senescence response should have evolved and whether there are reasons why cells become senescent that mean that we should you know, be a little bit cautious about rushing to kind of delete all the senescent cells we can get rid of, um, because that might uh, introduce uh, side effects that are undesirable. So tempering the enthusiasm that comes from the discovery of new capabilities with a certain amount of reserve to say, well, looks promising, um, you know, sort of what are the side effects, uh, you know, sort of what what can we realistically hope to deliver? I, I I'm 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 very very positive about the way the field is developing, but um, you know, sort of, uh, you you mentioned earlier that I uh, you know sort of have expressed caution, and I I feel that it is very important to express caution uh, in, in this area at this particular time. Yeah, no, I can see that, and uh, I think your focus on the sort of, if, as it were, the stability of the system to interventions is obviously key. But this is a systems feature. Um, I'm going to just, you know, I said you had this short-term caution and this long-term optimism. Uh, and as an economist, I always like to talk about short-term and long-term um, and not be too precise about sort of dates and timings. How do you see progress unfolding? Do you think it will be, you know, a specific drug that helps with some aspects of senolytic cells? Uh, will, will it be bit by bit? Or do you see a sort of a knowledge breakthrough that will then lead to a cluster? How do you see things evolving? I think it's quite difficult, actually, to sec second guess the future. We um, we are seeing advances. Um, I think because of the multiplicity of mechanisms, um, uh, uh, we you know we have to be prepared to discover that progress will be made in small increments rather than in fundamental you know sort of revolutionary breakthroughs or leaps um you know one should never be you know sort of too set in one's opinion in science we should always be prepared to be surprised by new discoveries but but i think what we know already about the mechanisms of aging suggests that you know sort of we may need to be tackling more than one thing at the same time in order to produce significant benefits so uh i yeah, I mean, uh, I, my, my expectation is that we will see relatively modest increments. The other thing that we have to recognize, and I, I really can't see that there's any way of shortcutting this, is that it takes time to demonstrate efficacy. Yeah. The, the human aging process is, you know, is quite a long and slow process. It plays out over a number of decades. 
Now, um, what that means is that if we want to make an intervention that may result in an imp improvement in aging, uh, and if we want to think about that being applied before the aging process is too far advanced, we're talking about you know sort of the, the middle years of life, um, uh, and it will therefore be quite some time before we have really good information. Um, you know, on what that does to, to the later life outcomes of aging. So, you know, it would be lovely if we could find ways of fast tracking some of this and, uh, you know, sort of advances in artificial intelligence, computer modeling, provide us with some opportunities to perhaps do some of the proof of principle work uh, in, in, you know, sort of in computerized models. Um, I've used models a lot in some of my own research. But ultimately, the thing that we need to do in order to be able to satisfy the regulatory agencies is to demonstrate that this works in real people in real time. And I think, you know, that has to be uh, a part of the constraints that should lead us to be a little bit cautious about, uh, you know, time scale. Absolutely. And I mean, just in, given the uh, design principles behind drug development as well and the degree of caution, I mean, um, it's it's going to take a long while, let alone the, the extra lags involved with aging, and presumably, you know, things like markers of uh, biological age. We've got to try and work out whether it's correlation or causation. So the same will go from that until we can establish that those biological markers truly do reflect long term aging. We've still got these long lags. Would you uh, agree with that, or are you excited about the potential of those those measures? Oh, I'd, I'd agree completely. I think. The, the whole question of developing good markers of aging uh, you know, is one that's been with us for really rather a long time. Um, and we, we have some interesting, some quite promising markers. Um, the, uh, one of the markers that's received a lot of attention and that seems to show perhaps the greatest promise is the development of what's called epigenetic clocks of aging. Um, uh, I think these are interesting. Uh, what's also very interesting is that you know, sort of even, uh, you know, sort of if one accepts the evidence, and I see no reason not to accept the evidence that they provide quite a good measure of biological aging, there's still, you know, a lot we don't know about what it is that they are actually measuring. Um, and it would be nice to be able to crack that problem uh, before we, you know, sort of proceed too much further. But yeah, I mean, if we could get good biomarkers of the aging process, that would certainly help with accelerating the time scales because we may be able to really get reliable indication of biological effectiveness without having, you know, sort of necessary to wait for all the stages of our progress uh, to have things validated in real people in real time. Um, that will still have to be done, uh, you know, sort of to some extent, but uh, ge getting a better hand on markers is important. This, um, you know, this short-term caution, long-term optimism, of course, raises some issues. So one of them, you know, right now, the main causes of death, cardiovascular disease, uh, cancer, dementia, pulmonary disease, they are clearly age-related. The mortality rates rise very strongly with age. Um, what do you think of cause to reallocate research funding away from more specific diseases towards the, the biology of aging itself, given that conflict between the short and long-term that we've discussed? I think it's terribly important that we should try to use insights that come from research on biology of aging to help our understanding of the, the various age-related diseases that we deal with. In, in today's you know, sort of medical research world, uh, the majority of conditions that command attention are chronic long-term conditions, the you know, classic diseases of aging, cardiovascular disease. Uh, neurodegenerative diseases, things like Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, and so on, osteoporosis, the, you know, arthritis. There's a, there's a whole long list for which age is the single biggest risk factor. And I think it's very striking that, you know, sort of a lot of research has been done uh, on the mechanisms that give rise to individual diseases with, you know, sort of really quite woefully inadequate attention to what it is that aging is bringing to the story. Um, and I think uh, a better connection between research on the biology of aging and research on these diseases is, uh, you know, 
in my view, almost certain to deliver uh, considerable enhancements to our understanding, you know, sort of of, of how these diseases come to be. Um, you know, it's it's not a new recognition. Uh, you know, I can think of authors who have written papers going back decades that have argued that we need to understand the biology of aging and connect it with disease. But it is beginning now to gain some traction. But still, we've got a very long way to go. Um, you know, a, a classic example uh, is research on Alzheimer's disease. Uh, we, if we go back some decades, you know, Alzheimer's disease was simply seen as an inevitable part of the aging process. Um, and then it was discovered that there were specific forms of uh, nerve cell changes that were seen in the brains of people who had had dementia when they were examined post-mortem. And that then led to the focus on the uh, you know, sort of amyloid plaques and the neurofibrillary tangles that you see in these brains as if you know, somehow these were mechanisms that were specific to the diseases, but not necessarily a part of the aging process. So the pendulum swung in a different direction. And I think the most uh, you know, hopeful signs of progress will come if we can kind of nudge the pendulum back to recognize that, you know, aging is really the central player uh, in the development of these conditions. There may be factors that are particular to the specific organ that, you know, that give it this kind of distinctive disease character. But the attempt to draw a line between you know what you might call normal aging and disease seems to me to be you know sort of counterproductive and indeed misguided so i i very strongly believe in the importance of trying to pursue closer interconnection between research on the biology of aging and research on so many other diseases um i think we need you know sort of in order to be able to make this a reality we you know we we need to find ways of you know, sort of incentivizing, motivating people to really pursue these connections. And I think, you know, sort of we, we also need to be uh, looking to introduce fairly fundamental changes into the, you know, the, the, the medical undergraduate curriculum so that the importance of aging, uh, you know, as a factor in the diseases that new doctors will be grappling with uh, throughout their working lives is something that is really properly appreciated. I couldn't agree more. In fact, the Longevity Forum, we're going to try and have an inaugural lecture this year in Oxford with precisely that aim of trying to widen interest in the topic amongst medical students, which I think is key. And as you said, this sort of slightly strange distinction and arguments we see about is aging a disease or not. You know, if we focus on health, it seems to me that that distinction becomes rather unimportant. Um, and trying to get those links together, I think, are, are crucial. Now, I want to also sort of move on to some of the other sort of short-term, long-term uh, challenges that come, because you, know, you mentioned earlier about the similarities in some biological thinking and economic thinking. And certainly, you know, when I play around with economic models about how people behave over the life cycle, it absolutely sort of mimics some of the logic you have about uh, how the body uh, focuses on um, uh, the disposable soma uh, hypothesis. And of course, if when life is short, we don't think about sort of sacrificing what we do today to benefit a distant and unlikely future. But with the ONS saying that median cohort life expectancy in the UK is now around early 90s, we clearly need to structure things differently. Uh, your long-run optimism says there may be all sorts of treatments later that will help us, but there's an awful lot that needs to be done now. So what do you think some of the key things individuals and society can do now governments need to prioritize to support healthy longevity across the lifespan um it's a question that i've given a lot of thought to and uh, enjoyed discussing with many different kinds of people uh, part of the challenge is you know when we're young we really you know sort of as you say we don't we don't think terribly much about old age um, and we don't factor in you know the sort of thought when we're deciding you know how to do things, how to spend our lives, you know, sort of, uh, you know, we don't think terribly much about its relationship to the aging process that will be running in our bodies. I think this is where a knowledge of the science can really help. I mean, the first thing to be said about the biology of aging is that 
you know, we now understand that aging begins very, very early on in our individual journeys through life. In fact, you know, even when we're in the womb still, uh, we're beginning to accumulate some of the defects that will contribute to the shape we'll be in when we're very old. So in terms of interventions towards a healthier lifestyle, it's really never too early to begin. The malleability, uh, you know, sort of allows us to slightly balance that by saying it's never uh, it's never too late to try to make improvements. It's just that you may not get the same kind of benefit. But trying, you know, trying trying to get this to be better appreciated, uh, you know, is an ongoing challenge. I've enjoyed over the years doing quite a lot of work in schools uh, and working with young people to to tell them about the science of aging, to try to engage their interest and to see what they come up with. Um, and some of that has been really exciting and quite inspiring. Um, I've you know, sort of given a talk about what we know about the science of aging to sixth formers, and then they've gone away and kind of interpreted that and presented it sometimes in you know artistic forms, an art installation, oh. you know, sort of a, a, a dance performance or whatever. Um, and to get uh, you know younger people thinking about you know what it is like to be old and what that means for the relationship with the older people in their lives and i think you know sort of w what i've perceived is that younger people actually seem to demonstrate a, a, a you know sort of a, a greater a greater openness a greater preparedness to kind of thinking about these things than perhaps do people you know sort of a couple of decades later, I think by the time you get into, your, you know, sort of thirties, forties, you're you're too busy with the coping with the here and now, <laughs> and uh, you know, sort of you know, getting on, you know, sort of in, in in the job world, perhaps raising your children and everything. So, young people seem to have a you know, sort of uh, this is anecdotal, and it, you know, sort of I, I I can't swear to the validity of what I'm saying, but seem to have a greater capacity for connecting with you know, sort of the journey across the life course than do necessarily people in the middle years. Um, but I think, you know, what we have to do is to, is somehow to encourage and enable people to think about the life course. Uh, and that affects almost everything in our society. I mean, yeah. you know, we, we have to think about changing attitudes. Uh, we have to think about how we build a more inclusive society. We have to think about how we design cities, how we design transport systems, how we construct our working lives, how we organize education. Um, and, uh, you know, sort of over the years, I've been involved in various exercises like, you know, Government Office for Science Foresight exercises, you know, sort of trying to gather evidence on these questions and contribute to guidelines, uh, you know, sort of, and I know that that's part of the work of the Longevity Forum and, you know, and other players in this. But Sometimes it feels as though the issues are reasonably well understood and recognized, but the actual tangible progress is still frustratingly slow and difficult. Um, and I, 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 I think this is a real issue for the future. We, 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 know the, you know, we know the enormity of the potential. We know the size of the prize. Um, but how we, how we actually help in a sort of society and you know politicians the the people who will make the decisions that may you know enable or hinder these kinds of uh, important steps to be taken you know this is this, this, you know this, this is exciting but it's also very challenging it is i mean it's it's designing a whole new structure of life and of course the very structure of government is based around the our structuring of life so you separate employment from education and pension i mean there's so many things that need to come together in an interlocking way uh, and i but i completely agree with you that i think you know this is an opportunity and for me as an economist you know the really big thing is that whatever your age given the gains to life expectancy you have more time ahead of you and that means you've got to invest more on your future and that's the changes of behavior that is required um and I do think the sort of the, the, the dominance of the demographic analysis of an aging society is a real challenge for us because you know that, that demographic story says falling birth rates, more people living longer, older cohorts are larger, you have more old people. And it sort of sets up a notion of a struggle between young and old about you know where resources are going to go. But as you've stressed, you know, the real change that's happened is the young have never had such a high chance of becoming old. 
So in a way, that separation of the young and the old makes less sense today than in any previous uh, social setting. So we've really got to think about this as something that's inclusive for all of society and how to build those, those links as well. I think that the demographic story, which is so dominant in economics and government, I think is a real hindrance. A real hindrance. Um, sorry, Tom, you want to say something? Yeah. No, I, I was going to say, I, I, I do agree with you completely on that. Um, and I think one of, the, one of the issues, and we've got to find meaningful ways of you know, breaking through on this one, is that demographics deals with people in the aggregate, um, and policy tends to deal with people in the aggregate. Uh, you know the, uh, the the context in which I said we you know we got started with the Newcastle eighty five plus study was something that used a fixed point of age to determine whether a person was asked to complete the census form or not. One of the things that has come out to me so clearly through the research that I've done with older people is the immense diversity. Um, uh, and we've got somehow to be able to, you know, sort of acknowledge, uh, you know, sort of the the diversity that exists, uh, you know, to in itself, it, it's a rich source of information if we could understand, you know, where that diversity comes from and build on it in positive ways. Um, but but we we have to get away from a kind of an approach which simply looks at the number that is the person's chronological age and makes assumptions makes policy decisions you know sort of makes enabling or disabling uh you know sort of decisions uh on the basis of that number alone and keith thomas in a lovely article a long while ago made a great point that actually that obsession with chronological age is quite modern and is a bureaucratic convenience uh you know for for large parts of a history people haven't been numerate or literate so they didn't know the year they were born or even their birthday. It was only when we started registering births and deaths that we started to focus on chronological age. And governments then used it as a sort of minister of simplification. And I can see it having an impact that's so adverse for all the reasons you just said. Let's take the labour market, for instance. I often see people focusing on the over 65 labour market. But actually, if you look in detail, some people over 65 are doing brilliantly in the labour market. They're, you know, they're healthy, they're educated, they're doing a great, but there are others who are really struggling. And in that level, age really isn't a very common um, issue amongst those individuals. It's all the stuff that we have to deal with at other aspects, other ages in the labour market that are important. So I think in many of these issues, actually, age isn't the key factor. And of course, that goes back to over a longer life, do we use it as an opportunity? to uh, redress imbalances that start earlier in life. Because if we don't, we're just going to see those inequalities just magnify. And I think that's going to be a really important part of actually making progress in how we support aging society. In some ways, putting less focus on age per se, more on the other characteristics. Yes, I'd, I'd agree with that very strongly. The the challenge is what you replace it with. Um, uh, but I think uh, it, it, it's very evident that we have to find a better way of dealing with this. And this, again, is where the science ultimately, you know, sort of is important to us because, you know, the science tells us that we've not got some sort of biological clock inside our bodies that's ticking away uh, that, you know, sort of uh, will dominate all the other things that we can do. And for me, what's you know, there's so many things that's fascinating about the science, but also it has a symbolism as well, which is just makes people aware that age is malleable. But as you said, we don't need the science to tell us that. We just need to look at the differences in life expectancy and healthy life expectancy by socioeconomic group. But somehow, you know, the science just makes it so apparent. And I hope that can be used as a basis for uh, government policy to really start thinking about how to exploit that malleability uh, in all ways. Um, now, we started by talking about disposable soma and your, your 1977 paper. Uh, very big question to end on, but what do you think we've learned since then? And what for you are the key questions that need answering going forward? Well, I mean, I think the key thing that we've learned is that aging is not programmed uh, and is malleable. Um, I think uh, we've also learned that older people have much more potential than we previously recognized. Um, so I think, you know, the challenges are uh, 
how do we enable more people to exploit this male malleability? How do we how do we change attitudes uh, in the science? Uh, you know, sort of the, the we're talking about quite a significant span of time in the science of aging. We, we've learned masses and masses of stuff, um, uh, and so the the richness of our knowledge. Uh, you know, has expanded enormously, um, and I'm very excited about what will come in the future. But uh, I think, you know, having been in aging research for you know for quite some years now, uh, the thing that seems to me to be the most important challenge that we face is how to connect what we're working, what we're discovering, uh, you know, sort of in in the lab in the in the scientific context with life as we live it mm. as people who are getting older um so yeah i i think we've learned masses but i think the the fundamental questions uh, are still in front of us i do often wonder actually which will be uh it's going to be quicker to change societies and cultural attitudes towards aging or some of the science the biology of it uh but that's a lovely uh, point to end on and thank you tom both for your time today and also all your work and books in this area which really are fascinating and incredibly influential so thank you andrew it's been a pleasure to talk to you and keep up the great work this broadcast has been brought to you by longevity forum as part of longevity week 2022 for more podcasts visit our website thelongevityforum.com or follow us on Twitter, longevity underscore forum.